Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much, Jean Dominique, for the introduction. I am greatly honored to be here. It's also a great pleasure to be here with all of you in this highly historical room. People have always cherished and been fascinated by the astonishing diversity of, um, let me see, uh, it doesn't seem to work. <laughs> Okay. Then, then the, next. the next, okay. So, as I said, uh, people have always cherished the astonishing variety of form and function of plant life on Earth. At the same time, we understand that uh, if we are to um, manage and conserve plant biodiversity and ecosystems, we need to identify a small number of general principles underlying this remarkable variety. So if you allow me a metaphor and you think of a carpet, in a carpet, like in any fabric, you can distinguish two main portions. Um, one is the outer weft and the other is the inner warp. Most of us, are really attracted by the weft of the carpet because of the richness of color and texture it has. But those who make a living trading carpets know that the really, really important part in any carpet is the warp because the uniform and dull and coarse threads that form the warp actually are the ones that keep the carpet from unraveling. So we could use this uh, metaphor to refer to the fabric of life, to plant biodiversity on Earth. We know that there are about 400,000 vascular plants on the planet. We celebrate them. And at the same time, we know we cannot really understand each of these species in detail. So from the very beginning of uh, plant ecology, Perhaps before ecology was recognized as such, there has been a um, quest for identifying a small number of general principles, a small number of patterns of um, plant adaptive specialization syndromes underlying all this um, apparent uh, uh, variety. And this quest for final syndr uh, um, general syndromes of plant functional specialization has a very long history. These are just some of the prominent examples through, throughout the 20th century. And these ideas have been tested repeatedly in an empirical way. But information beyond single plant organs and beyond local restricted floras still lacking most of the time. So we decided to go for this gap. We wanted to identify general syndromes of plant adaptive specialization at the whole plant level and at the global scale. We also wanted to deal with, to include all three dimensions of a plant's Darwinian struggle for existence, which are growth, survival, and reproduction. Now, to make this operational, we needed to identify a relatively small number of uh, functional traits that would be fundamental enough to encapsulate these three dimensions and at the same time available for a very large number of plants worldwide. So we finally settled for plant height, uh, the size of seeds or spores, leaf mass per area, which is a measure of how much carbon is invested per unit of leaf lamina, leaf nitrogen concentration, the size of leaves, and stem density. Now, putting together a data set of all these traits for a thousands and thousands of plants uh, worldwide wasn't a trivial undertaking. We were only able to do this thanks to TRY. 
CRI is the world's first and largest global communal repository of information of plant vascular traits. Sorry, the traits of vascular plants. This is a relatively young initiative. It's only about 10 years old. Um, it's, it was funded uh, by a very small number of scientists, including prominently Sandra Laborel, a member of this academy, and also myself. And since that uh, moment, TRI has grown exponentially and now has an enormous amount of information and has served more than 3,000 projects worldwide. And it served very well in our particular case. We were able to uh, put together a very comprehensive functional trait data set for vascular plants coming from all biomes and all uh, inhabited um, climate zones in the world. Very, very broad um, set of growth forms. And the number of species was just over 46,000 coming from very many plant families. And the database includes some of the most extreme values of these fundamental plant functional traits known to science. So for example, we had plants from about one centimeter or less tall all the way to plants which are about almost 100 meters. Um, plants with seeds or spores which are smaller than a speck of dust all the way to 20 kilogram seeds. Leaves which are less than one millimeter wide all the way to leaves which are almost three meters wide. And the same with the other traits. So although we don't claim to have covered the whole uh, range of these traits on Earth, we think we are reasonably close. And what we wanted to do with this data set is to construct the global trait space for vascular plants. So if we imagine a six-dimensional space, each of the dimensions corresponding to one of these uh, key functional traits, what would be the size of that volume? What would be its shape? and how would be species distributed within that volume. So we constructed that uh, functional space and we compared it to a number of null models. And this is how the functional trait space for all vascular plants on the planet looks like. Unfortunately, I cannot show you in all six dimensions. I can only show three dimensions at a time. But the important lesson here is that this observed um, global plant trait space is significantly different from all the null models, strongly indicating strong trade-offs and constraints in fundamental vascular plant design and to our knowledge, this is the first time it was tested formally. Now, this is just the shape of the outer shell of the volume. We also wanted to know how different species are distributed within that volume. And for doing that, we did something extremely simple. We ran a principal component analysis of all those species for which we had empirically measured trade values for all the six traits. And we found that about 75% of the total multidimensional variation was actually captured by just one single plane. This plane, which we call the global spectrum of plant form and function. In this uh, plane, each little dot represents a species. One species is shown only once in this plane. And the vectors represent the loading, the importance of the different traits in defining the plane. And the icons represent the lowest 
and large and highest extremes of the vectors. So for example, um, this one goes from tiny plants all the way to really tall plants. This vector indicates tiny uh, leaves, very large leaves, uh, very low nitrogen in the leaves, very high nitrogen content. Now, one major axis of variation in this uh, spectrum is this axis, is an axis of size of the whole plant and of plant organs, going all the way from tiny plants with tiny leaves and seeds to tall plants with large leaves and seeds. The second major axis of variation, this one, is an axis of leaf resource economy, going from conservative, robust leaves, which grow slowly and live very long and are poor in nitrogen, all the way to very acquisitive leaves, which are flimsy, nitrogen rich, grow very fast and live a very short time. The best way to imagine this global spectrum of uh, plant form and function is to think of it as the uh, galactic plane of the Milky Way. If you think of the Milky Way, it's slightly tilted, and although it has celestial bodies in more than two dimensions, uh, the Milky Way is not a blobby cloud. Actually, most of the biomass, most of, sorry, it's not the biomass, most of the celestial body, most of the mass of the galaxy is uh, concentrated into a rather flat galactic disk. In a similar way, most of the variation in six dimensions of the global space of plant functional traits is concentrated onto this plane. Now, uh, let me show you some of the extreme uh, designs at the fringes of the spectrum, so you have a better mental picture of what's there. At this stream, the Brazil nut, Bertoletia excelsa. At the other extreme, Arabidopsis. This is, of course, our favorite model plant. You can see here how extreme it is with respect to the rest of the spectrum. It's actually sitting in one remote corner of the design galaxy. At this stream, tough-leafed, slow-growing uh, gymnosperms, such as Araucaria, the monkey puzzle. At the other stream, flimsy, submerged aquatics, such as Utricularia and Muriophilum. Here, highly conservative uh, Australian iron goods, the genus Hakia, mostly, all the way to the tender by highly toxic members of the genus Datura the devil snare. At this corner, uh, heathers, and at the opposite end, the sacred lotus. So you have a feeling of what are the most extreme uh, trait combinations here. Now, what about the distribution in the bulk of the spectrum? One interesting thing is that uh, different major taxonomic groups occupy different portions of the spectrum. So the gymnosperms are highly confined to one corner, whereas the angiosperm occupy the whole functional space, including that of the gymnosperms. It seems that uh, the angiosperms taking advantage of evolutionary um, innovations in leaf anatomy and in vascular tissue have been able to um, explore areas of leaf size and nitrogen content and in general acquisitiveness that were beyond the reach of the gymnosperms. Now, even within the angiosperms, not every portion of the spectrum is equally popular. If we now concentrate on the colors, the colors are um, a probability density map. So areas which are very light are populated by a very, very low number of species, whereas red hot areas 
mean a concentration of a really large number of species with very similar trait combinations. You can see here that most of our evolutionary heritage, in terms of number of species rather than biomass on the planet, actually lies in these two functional hotspots. One is an herbaceous one, and the other is goody one, trees mostly. A very large number of independent, phylogenetically distant uh, orders and families of plants converge into these two hotspots, suggesting that these are successful trade, uh, trade constellations that have been achieved repeatedly during the evolutionary history of the angiosperms. But we think that not only <laughs> the hotspots are uh, interesting here, the cold spots as well. Why are these areas, why are these fringes so sparsely populated by species? Part of the answer is, of course, just purely biomechanical. You cannot have a very large seed hanging from a tiny plant. You cannot hang a very large and flimsy leaf from the top of an extremely tall tree. It just wouldn't work mechanically or functionally. But there are a very large number of trade combinations that would be completely viable from the biomechanical point of view and still extremely rare. So we think that this is the hallmark of natural selection. So this, um, excuse me, these uh, fringes in the global spectrum, these fringes which are populated with a very low density of species, in a way are representative the front line and the receding line of plants selective and evolutionary battle with the environment. The question is where these fringes represent the first winners or the last losers on the battle. Whether these um, plants in the, in the fringes are um, the first emerging phenotypes, the avant-garde, uh, exploring a new expansion of um, the global trade space, or are the losers, the last relics of a combination of traits that used to be successful and now are not successful anymore. We believe that there are examples of the two kinds of outliers here. If you look at this area, most of the plants we eat and with which we have been having fun and killing each other for thousands of years actually lie in this particular area. This is a highly acquisitive area of the spectrum, which we are protecting and promoting. Not only that, but using natural, sorry, um, artificial selection, we are uh, expanding. We are pushing the border of the global spectrum into increasingly more acquisitive phenotypes. At the same time, there's another area, opposite area of the spectrum, highly conservative region of the plain, which is populated by a number of plant groups that seem to be losing the selective and evolutionary battle for a long, while, for a long time, and increasingly so in the face of rapid land use change. This is how the plants in that um, blue-green uh, area of the spectrum look like. There are very many species on the surface. They look very different from each other, but in terms of the fundamental traits we are looking at in the global spectrum, they are all in the same corner. These plants are being uh, replaced fast, but a much smaller number of uh, plants who more or less look like that they are equally specialized, but with completely different plant traits. They are much more acquisitive. 
and they are again uh, representing the avant-garde, just uh, winning the battle uh, with the help of um, fast land use change and massive release of mineral nutrients in the environment by our activities. How useful is the global spectrum of plant form and function beyond our particular area of uh, research? Well, the, the global spectrum represents the first global synthetic picture of essential functional diversity of vascular plants. As such, is useful for a number of broad brush global scale initiatives. Um, it's extremely simple, but we believe that simplicity is actually strength rather than a limitation. Uh, this is because here you can uh, summarize the basic design of any species in a quantitative continuous way with just two coordinates. That makes it really simple and attractive for initiatives such as um, global vegetation models or global ecosystem models. It also provides a global atlas, a backdrop, a navigational chart onto which one can follow the trajectories over time of species and communities. For example, in the face of environmental change in the past, and in the future. So, in conclusion, the worldwide six trait design space of vascular plants is remarkably constrained and lumpy. Its variation is largely concentrated into a plane, which we call the global spectrum of plant form and function, which is defined by two dimensions which are necessary and enough at this scale. One is size and the other is the quality of leaf tissue. This spectrum is very granular with strong convergence to a relatively small set of successful triad combinations, the hotspots I just show you. And this spectrum provides a backdrop for trajectories of species and lineages and ecosystems across time. And I would like to finish with a big thank to all the colleagues who have actively worked in this project. And I would like to mention two people in particular. One is Hien Katke, who had put an enormous effort in putting together the database. And the other person is Sandra Laborel, with whom we had the early vision that uh, resulted in the work I'm showing today. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. We now have time for questions. Oh, it, behind you. Yes. I, I missed the point. Uh, how many dimensions initially are you power spectra? Right. Uh, How many par I mean, what parameters does it include? Initially, yeah. um, initially, of course, we, is this working? Okay. 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 Initially, we have, of course, six dimensions. Six. Six, yes, because we had six fundamental traits. That is something we embedded in the assumptions. We say, okay. And how will you project them? Okay, we projected them. We, we did the, the, the extraction of axis, yeah. and we found that 75% of the whole uh, uh, variation was captured in the first axis, right? Which was directly driven by size of uh, the leaves, sorry, the size of the of height, stem density, seed size, and the second dimension was, of course, the global spectrum of, plant, uh, of uh, leaf economy. Yeah. 
on this Jean-Pierre Changeux, right there. Thank you very much for the useful uh, description. How does the uh, genetic map, the, the gene sequences of all these species map uh, with the uh, structure that you showed us? What is the correlation? Can you find uh, what, uh, a dimension which uh, you may add up on top of that to see whether there is some relationship with the, with the evolution of the genome? We did no genetic study on this. We, we have no genetic dimension to this study I presented. It's purely phenoty phenotypic. And for each species, we average the world. Uh, we, we had, for some species, we only had trait information for this, the only place in the world where it exists. For a species that exists in many areas of the world, some species are incredibly common, we just averaged. And the, the, in the way that each species was represented by only one point. Pierre Ancrenaz and then uh, Antoine Danchin. I've been very, very interested by your presentation, even so I'm an astronomer. You know that we are fascinated with the springs, hot water, which comes out in Enceladus, in Rhea, in uh, Titan, and they look like the same springs as we have in the pa South Pacific, deep underneath. Where would you put the algae, the plants, which are growing at 10,000, 11,000 meters below the sea surface with no oxygen, only sulfur and hot water. I think it's a fascinating comment. Of course, it was only for vascular plants, right? So we didn't have any algae. It would be absolutely fascinating. I, I don't know much about those algae. I don't know whether they, you know, they have these traits or not. Obviously, for the nitrogen content will be utterly relevant, I would guess. But it would be really fascinating when, when, when the information is available to, to do a similar spectrum exercise for them. And for fungi, too. Yeah, Thank we're you. just starting with vascular plants. Yeah. Antoine Darchin, also in this direction, right there. Yeah, okay. I think it's extremely interesting to have specific choices as models, okay? And I think your study uh, asks for a very surprising question, at least for most people working in plant biology and genetics. You said that Arabidopsis is completely, well, on the border of the picture. Do you still think that this is a good model? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Right, okay, um, I think it's a very good model for detailed genetic and development studies. Now, whether Arabidopsis is representative of the rest of the plants in the, in the planet, in many areas, obviously no. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree with you, yeah. I don't think it's a good model. Catherine Cesarski on, on this side. Yes, another astronomer. <laughs> you made um, a comparison with the shape of, the, of our own galaxy, the Milky Way, which is mostly on a plane. But there is another comparison that you can make in astronomy because we have similar questions regarding the shape of galaxies, their properties, luminosity, density, velocity dispersion, metallicity, etc. We have a whole set of uh, conditions, and uh, if you take elliptical galaxies, people have found that they are correlations between this and that in such a way that in the end they get arranged on what we call the fundamental plane. And this looks very similar to what you have. It looks like nature likes this kind of, you know, when you can have all kinds of possibilities, it looks for a fundamental plane and uh, for correlations. It's fantastic that in plants and galaxies, you find it in a very similar way. But 
May I have a question? Uh, what happens if you plot things in terms of biomass? Uh, weight your, your various points, but uh, give them the uh, a weight uh, that corresponds to the amount on the Earth, or how, how does that look? In the planet. Okay, we are writing, we are working on that right now. I can give you a kind of very preliminary rule of thumb answer. Most of the biomass in the planet is um, actually on, on the herbaceous hotspot, the one to the left, and depending on the area of the world, it's um, south of the woody hotspots. And many of the areas which are very extreme, so uh, many of the fringes are actually fringes in terms of design and also in terms of biomass, except the really acquisitive one I, I show you, the one, we, the one we are creating and pushing right now. Yeah, that's a really good question. All right, I think we, we have to stop at this point. Many thanks to our three speakers.